Hi, I'm John. And I'm Meredith. And this is No Talking in the Library, uh, social distancing edition, uh, coming to you from our I'm in my kitchen now. You seem to have changed locations from... Yes, I'm in the second bedroom of storage stuff. Right, right, right. Uh, so, you know, once again, we thought we'd uh, talk to you, talk a little bit about the things we've been watching and what we've been doing to kill the time. But so anyway, so I sent you uh, a thing the other day about this documentary that I had seen, and I was... Surprised, and I, I have to say a little bit gratified that you actually went and watched it. Uh, yes, that would be 89. 89. Um, 89. Um, and let me try and describe it, since it's your... Right, it's, please you do. Know, um, this is a documentary about Arsenal's Unlikely, would you say? Uh, uh, 1989 a win of the Premier League soccer, correct? Correct, yes. Against li the big bad Liverpool. Yeah, Liverpool uh, in the late 80s was one of the best teams that has ever played the game. I mean, they were just unbelievably good. And um, You are a massive Arsenal fan, correct? I am a massive Arsenal fan. Um, and it, following Arsenal for a long time, you get, you really enjoy the, the successes because they tend to be fairly, fairly rare. Um, but Liverpool that year started out as even money to win the title. I mean, so the the betting action was was even money for Liverpool, and I think Arsenal was about sixteen to one. They'd just gotten a new coach, uh, George Graham, who'd been a star for the team in the nineteen seventies, uh, and he came in, cut away a lot of dead wood, got rid of uh, Charlie Nicholas and Graham Ricks, who were who were very highly paid players, but who were not really producing. Brought in a bunch of young guys, set up the 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 back four I'll just I'll just talk about this one technical thing and then we can talk about things that are actually interesting to people but he set up this back four that was uh Tony Adams Steve Bold Lee Dixon and uh Nigel Winterburn and um who was the sort of iconic back four uh defense for Arsenal for for years and years after that and um it's just it's a fantastic story because they you know they started very well and then they kind of faded and then this is also uh, 1989 is the year that uh, many Americans don't remember, but most people around the world do, of the uh, horrific disaster in April at uh, Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, where... Uh, 97 people, I think, were crushed to death. Yeah, 96. Um, 96. I only, I only say because justice <laughs> for the 96 yeah. is the big, uh, is the big uh, rallying cry about that. And actually, I just rewatched the... Uh, the 30 for 30, the ESPN documentary series did uh, an episode about that incident. It was the, it was the finals of the FA cup between uh, Liverpool and Nottingham forest. And uh, they, there was a, a an absolutely catastrophic failure, uh, organizational failure by the, the uh, South Yorkshire police department who put too many people in an area and then just, it was a catastrophe. I, I really recommend that 30 for 30. It's 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 very compelling viewing. You can watch it uh if you if you spend the sort of four ninety nine a month for the ESPN plus uh streaming service. When sports start again, you'll get a lot of interesting stuff, but you also get all of the 30 for 30s. And we could do a whole episode on on episodes of of 30 for 30 that we enjoy. But uh but so when Arsenal came to play, so just to sort of set the scene for people and then you can watch, you know, I, I hope you watch it yourselves because you as a sort of, as a person who doesn't really follow the game, uh, much less either of the teams involved, uh, seem to seem to, to, to enjoy it. Um, but just to sort of set the scene, it came down to the last game of the season and Arsenal had to go play at Liverpool at Anfield. They're, they're, iconic stadium and had to win by two goals which hadn't happened I mean I don't think they mentioned this in the documentary but Liverpool hadn't been beaten at home by two goals since 1985 I mean they hadn't been beaten in, in by that kind of margin at home in, in four or five years um, but it was a it was a remarkable game and and I, a really remarkable story and I think you know one of those things that even for people who are not 
huge fans of soccer or or what have you, uh, something that something that should prove really really entertaining. You can watch it. They have it on Netflix. Um, yeah, I was surprised. It made soccer probably the most interesting uh, men's soccer, the most interesting probably anyone has ever found it. <laughs> um, because the the last game was, uh, I don't really understand the esoteric rules that why they needed to win by two um, in order to win. They were. Like, it's a little weird. Like you win the game by one, but you still lose. Right. Yeah. They were. They were. Uh, they were three points behind, so you get three points for winning a game, uh, and but also, uh, so winning by winning the game would have gotten them three points so they would have been tied and then the first tiebreaker is uh goal differential how many more goals you score than you give up and uh, but Arsenal. i found like the game had a very almost like i don't really think of soccer as like thing exciting things happening in that extra time right i was also really surprised that the players like have no idea how much time is going by Right. In those days, they didn't have a clock up on the... They had a clock. Some some places had a clock. So Arsenal, actually, Highbury Stadium had what was called the clock end. There was like one end uh, where there was a big clock. And it wouldn't tell you how much how much time was left in the game, but it would tell you what time it was, what time of day it was, and then you could sort of estimate how much time. Yeah, so I, I never understand extra time in soccer. It feels like the refs just, like, make up a number. <laughs> Right. Like, all right, you get two more minutes. It's, right. it's fine. And then the so the players had no idea how much time was left, and right. they ended up scoring that second like crucial goal in like the last seconds of the this game, right. um, which is really I kind of think of more of like an ice hockey thing. Like when you think of exciting things happening with no time left. Right. Right, right. Um, and I actually watching this, I felt a lot of parallels with uh, the 1980 Miracle on Ice. Sure, yeah. Especially I, with the idea that the team was made up by of a whole bunch of young players, and right. then there was also the inner team conflict between the Northerners. I'm not entirely okay, right. I'm not entirely sure. sure. Yeah. It was like the conflict between the guys who are playing for Boston and the guys who played for her Brooks at Minnesota right. um, having to come together to right. beat her greater enemy. Right. There was that moment where Lee Dixon, who was new to the team, he'd mm-hmm. come over from Stoke city. Um, actually, I, uh, b- before I get to that, there's a, I just watched a, a very long interview with Lee Dixon. The, the uh, uh, NBC is putting up a lot of these sort of, uh, or I guess this was, this was Irish TV, but anyway, he, uh, he said that when, so he'd been playing for Stoke City, who were in the the league below. So for those of you who don't know, like England, like the top, the the football association has four levels, and if you are in the bottom three at the end of the season, you get sent down. At, in those days, and if you were in the top three, you would go up and play in the next league up. So he was playing in Stoke City in the league down, and and George Graham, the manager of Arsenal, who's a very intense guy and a, a serious like disciplinarian and a guy you didn't George Graham had come into the team at the beginning of the year was like okay you have six every one of you has six weeks to show me that you belong here and if you're not you're out so anyway he like he 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 told Lee Dixon Lee Dixon found out that he was interested in 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 signing him and so Lee Dixon drove down with his manager and they met at like what we would call a service plaza uh halfway between London and, and Stoke which is up kind of in the northern part of the country and they uh on the way down, he was with his manager from Stoke and he said to him, well, how much money should I ask for, right? Because he'd never, you know, he was on about, uh, he was on some very small amount of money, I think like 250 or 300 pounds a week, which is not much for a professional athlete. And uh, he said, well, we'll ask for a thousand a week, right? The Arsenal's a big club. So anyway, they go to this service plaza and his manager goes to talk to some of the Arsenal technical people and Lee Dixon gets in, this car with George Graham and George Graham says, you know, we're interested in you, et cetera, et cetera. The discussion goes on. And then finally, uh, uh, George Graham says, you know, we're interested in you and we'll, we'll pay you 500 pounds a week. And Dixon said, well, you know, I have this, I have a, you know, a wife who just bought a house. Like I need, I was kind of hoping for a thousand a week. And, uh, 
Graham, without a word, got out of the car, slammed the door and walked away. And Dixon was just like, oh my God. And he, so he gets out of the car and he goes over to his manager from Stoke. And the guy, the manager, his manager at Stoke was like, what did you say to him that caused him to do that? And he was like, I just asked him for the amount of money that you told me was the right amount of money to ask for. And so they drive back to Stoke. They're convinced the deal's off. And Dixon is like completely, completely freaked out about the whole thing. So the next day he calls up George Graham and says, I, I really want to come down and see you. Like I want, you know, so he drives down to London. He goes to meet with George Graham and he goes in and he says, look, I'll, I'll sign for whatever. Like I want to make this move happen. And Graham was like, oh, I was just testing you. We'll sign you for 750. And uh, Dixon was like, okay, thanks for, you know, giving me a heart attack about the, about the whole thing. Um, but uh, they, uh, you know, there's that scene in the, in the documentary when they're about to play Tottenham for the first time. Tottenham is Arsenal's closest geographical rival, a team that, that I mean, really, the, they hate each other from the old neighborhood, although Arsenal started out in a different part of London. But the, their stadiums are pretty close. But the North London Derby, as they call it, is the sort of, you always want to, you always want to win that. And Dixon is, is from Manchester, I think. And before the game, he's getting stared at by his teammates. And finally, three or four of them, like, corner him in his sort of, like, cubby. And they're like, okay, here's the deal. You're, you're a northerner, and you don't know what's up. But this is the North London Derby, and you really need to do the business today. Uh, and it just got him, like, it's like, all right, this is, you know. Anyway, it's a, it's a really good documentary. It's, I, I love Lee Dixon, too, because there's that moment, and the, then I'll stop talking about this, where right at the end, when the when – the, like John Lukic gets the ball, the Arsenal goalkeeper, and instead of like kicking it up the field, there's like only seconds left. He like throws it to Dixon, and Dixon was like, "I couldn't, I don't know what he was doing. I didn't want it." Uh, and I think that's a sort of real moment of candor for someone in a moment like that. Like, why is he giving it to me? Like, I certainly don't want it. Um, uh, but I really did enjoy this, um, and even someone who is not such a soccer fanatic as you are it was you know very entertaining right. and it's no secret uh, as you know I am just a massive uh, fan of sports documentaries sure. kind of across the board because I really I mean where what other genre could you watch that has like every story is just an encapsulation of like all of human emotion like all the stories always have you know, David versus Goliath or some sort of like greatest moment, lifetime achievement. And it always gets my heart racing. Like I'll be, they'll be showing clips and I'm like, it's like, it never hasn't happened yet. Like I'm watching it for the first time and they just are, you know, yeah, I, and they've got such great rewatchability, I think too. And sure. as you, um, John mentioned dropping for I did drop the 499 399 499 for the ESPN plus so that I could watch all of um the 30 for 30s uh, oh, yeah. so, which I've been watching a bunch of of the newer ones that I hadn't seen yet and re-watching um some of my my favorites yeah yeah, um, yeah. we've talked a lot about this but but what what have you yeah. watched lately that you really enjoyed? Well, um, of the new ones, I watched the um, the one about uh, the rivalry between. Uh, oh, my cat's a little bit in the, sh <laughs> the shot now. Um, the rivalry between uh, Joey Chestnut and uh, Takeru Kobe Kobayashi, Kobayashi, the yeah. competitor of eaters, the Nathan mm -hmm. Hot Dog right um competition um i watched the um the there's no place like home which is the one about the the guy who coordinated uh winning the auction to get the original rules of basketball um right. as written by james naismith went to right. auction and um of i almost kansas not Kentucky, right. kansas right. Yeah. um Kansas fan, which is where Naismith was a coach and lived his life and sort of built basketball as we know it today. Right. And he felt like those rules really needed to uh, to make their way back. And 
that was just, I didn't think I was going to be interested in that one, but oh my god, like, something is like basketball auction, it can like, get me excited about something I had no idea that I would be interested in. Right, right, right. Um, and I rewatched One and Not Done, the uh, Calipari, yeah, uh, Calipari at Kentucky. Yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I just rewatched the other day because I was sort of like flipping through the, the uh, 30 for 30 offerings. Uh, I hate Christian Leitner. Um, <laughs> That's a good one too. Which, yeah, I, I, I absolutely love that one. I really did hate Christian Leitner um, because he was so good. I mean, really, like the, the documentary is great because Christian Leitner is a nice guy, actually. And he's, he's a very intelligent, uh, very like articulate guy who played, I, I hated Duke to begin with. And then I went to the University of North Carolina and like uber hated them. Um, that but I really was a Duke alumni who was trying to outbid Kansas for the basketball rules because right. that's, yeah, that's just what Duke I heard. for you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And I can remember when he hit that shot to win the NCAA tournament over, what's his name, Shepard for Kentucky. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I understand not wanting to foul in that moment, but I swear if he's taking that shot right then, he's making those from the free throw line. Like, I'm just going to grab his – obviously in hindsight but it's a really good it's a really good documentary and a really a really good series um, yeah uh, oh uh the day the series stopped that one's excellent about right. the earthquake yeah 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 oh I, in cal cal it was like the the two teams were both from right, california was, playing in the world series oakland versus san francisco they're from almost the same town yeah uh, that's and, a good uh, one yeah yeah so i've been uh binging on sort of I talked in maybe the last one about my obsession with Bear Grylls and um and basically nature survival television I've watched a lot of Survivor Man lately um which which obviously you know as as we talked about before has kind of more authenticity because Les Stroud is just out there it's himself and a you know a bunch of camera equipment but so uh, Bear Grylls did this other series called Running Wild um in which he uh, took celebrities out into the wild. And some of it's like the last, the fifth season of it is on Disney. Um, it's on Disney plus uh, the rest of it is on prime and you have to pay for it. So you can just, if one, if people are interested, you can just look at like which episodes you might find interesting. Some are way better than others, but um, the, the first one that I watched uh I mean, I texted you today about the, I watched one today, I think it's from season three, which, which is taking like Julianne Huff around the, the bush in South Africa. And I'm like, you know, neither of us are like huge fans of Julianne Huff, but I have to admit that she went up in my estimation because within about the first three minutes of that episode, he had like dabbed her face with elephant dung and uh, <laughs> for like real authenticity. And she was cool with it. So, um, but I, I watched, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I'm just going to finish, finish by saying that yeah. I, I went, I watched the first episode that I watched had, uh, it was Brie Larson in a mangrove swamp in Panama or somewhere like that on some island off the coast of Panama. And uh, I was really impressed with Brie Larson. She really handled the whole thing like a boss. She was never like, sometimes you watch the episodes and the people are kind of freaking out. Um, she was like completely mel. Like at one point they were going to do this like, Tyrolean traverse across a across a sort of like small lake that had they could see that there were crocodiles like in the lake and Brie Larson at a certain point was like yeah I'm a little worried about the crocodile situation which <laughs> is like one of the more dramatic understatements ever um but she's so you know the part of these episodes is Bear hanging around with these people sort of interviewing them or like asking them questions about um their careers and their lives and what motivates them. And Brie Larson just came off as this really together individual, uh, very bright and very, uh, I mean, obviously massively, don't need me to say massively talented, the woman who's <laughs> won the best actress, best actor Oscar. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so uh, I enjoyed that series a lot more than I thought it would because you know, some, it's, it's, a little, it's a little uneven, but, but a lot of the sort of, uh, the interview segments actually and it's also kind of fun to watch like you know hollywood types being forced to eat like 
who Bugs knows what. And <laughs> raw fish and stuff. Yeah. Grubs and things, right? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, the only other thing I was watching was, um, and unexpectedly, and only because you kind of got my mind directed towards sports docs, um, the QB1 Beyond the Lights on Netflix. Oh, really? Have you? Do you know anything about this, or have you seen anything? I, I know the basic sort of outlines of the story. I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's a series uh, created, and I don't know if it's directed, but it's produced by Peter Berg, um, and anyone who isn't familiar with him, he is also the creator of Friday Night Lights, um, the series that ran in 2006. Um, one of the most phenomenal, I think, series, I think you and I both agree on that. Sure, like, yeah, about absolute classic. High school football. Uh, it is the show I'm sure someone has harassed you to watch and is probably said, it's not about football. It's about the town. <laughs> right. It's funny. Um, I, I will just say that like Katrina really loves that show. And I always find it kind of funny because it's, it's about two things that she really doesn't like very much, i.e. football in Texas. But, and that's a lie. It is about football. I'm right. Yeah, that, that that's true. If yeah. you really, really, really hate football, you're not going to like this. On the fence about it, I say check out the first episode. Sure. But yeah. QB1 Beyond the Lights is almost the same thing as Friday Night Lights, except it's it's real. I mean, right. real. Uh, it, it follows, I think each season follows three different um, high school football quarterbacks and sort of their last season as they navigate, you know, their football careers, their future in college, family, friends. And it's it's not bad. Uh, it's funny because it is shot identically to Friday Night Lights. So there's like a lot of high school football footage often slowed down with soulful guitar riffs played like behind it. Like it's, right. it's comical how, how much it, it, looks like Friday Night Lights. Right, talk about uh, life imitating art. Yeah, so uh, Peter Berg knows, knows his high school football. I mean, the man has been, you know, attempting to recreate uh, some version of it for the last decade, basically. Um, so it's, it's compelling, it's gripping, um, uh, but I would just recommend watching Friday Night Lights uh, <laughs> overall. Yeah, absolutely. If that's, you haven't that's already. A very good, a very good use of your time for sure. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, that's uh, about uh, all Our we time, have planned. Think, probably, yeah. Yeah, for the evening, we'll be back next week with more stuff, and maybe we'll be off the sports thing by then. Yeah. Who knows? Probably not. I've watched a few more Marvel movies, so we'll see where I'm at next week. All right. Well, yeah, we could definitely talk about that. I'm, you know that I have certain obsessions, but we'll get to that later. All right. Well, All right. talk to you later. All right. I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye.